Welcome, everybody. With apologies to Edmund Mann, I am Joshua Pierce, and I will be your host for the entire evening, along with my excellent, wonderful friend, who I've known since 1982. We've been on tour together from such places as England, Italy, Norway, Switzerland, and Russia and other points throughout the United States. Now, without any further ado, I want to introduce my friend, as well as your friend, he's Johnny! Yeah. Yeah. outside the box and as uh, some of you know I'm a very deep thinker and uh, I needed a <laughs> I needed a, a significant box you know a, a box that merited thinking outside of and so I thought I would do that with the theremin today and uh, you know point out that it looks a little bit like a dog with one ear up, one ear down, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh... Johnny, you're exaggerating. All right, so I'm going to do a slight recital. It's very short, very micro. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't see back. He's a very If you bring one of these mini you. micro amps, you don't see back at all. Let's see, let's see. I'm going to start off with a very famous piece of music. I'm sure my, my good friend Rob Schwimmer knows it's probably in his repertoire. Oh, I never heard it. Well, you haven't heard it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and what is that piece? And uh, that piece is called uh, <coughs> Bugs Bunny being Ooh. chased down the rabbit hole by a Mafat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know that one. I knew it. Right? This is what I was afraid of. We're going to cut that section. There we go. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> there we are. Looney Tunes cartoon, Bugs Bunny. <coughs> Maybe a little higher up there. <coughs> you must have heard it before. Please. <laughs> go to the bridge. Go to the bridge. Now what I want to say to you here is, fear is in the news. Fear is in the news, and um, perhaps we can have a war on fear. You know, like we have wars on all these other things that we have wars on. And I would like to point out uh, that fear has ear in it. It's very important. And scare has care in it. Because you you won't scare unless you care. I know what fear has fat in it too. Fat and mat rhyme. <laughs> Next. Uh, to, to celebrate fear, as we head into the war on fear, I present the most famous anonymous thing I can do. Performances. I should be using the microphone, right, Lawrence? <laughs> we'll start doing performances called the IFMM. International, huh? There we go. The International Festival of Microtonal Music. We are connecting. And 
along that line, I imagine a, a future kind of beautiful, like on a wonderful, lovely day. Where I'm driving a motorcycle. <laughs> into his own body. Foolishly, of course. It's the Ooh. end of the movie. End. He's, he's up on a spider web. <laughs> Spider's coming. Somebody opens the door. <laughs> Professor! Who gets bit? Professor! They don't hear him. He's off on the side. He's going like this. Help me. Help me. Oh, I remember that. One? But they don't see him. They close the door. They leave. Presumably, this spider has a nice meal. I will now have the theremin say, help me. Oh, this should be interesting, everybody. We will talk. to one of the great science fiction characters of all time, R2-D2. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you would join me again, Joshua, San Mike, San Mike. Well, how about left-handed Mike? X. Okay. And we're going to be a team as we... Wasn't that interesting? We're a team. Yeah, yeah we, we have that. Oh, okay. All these years. All right, so... Yeah, long time. Ooh. All right, so we're going to do R2-D2. <laughs> You're going to be arrhythmic with your right hand like this. Arrhythmic. It's in the alphabet A. <laughs> like this right, Johnny? That's it. Don't be predictable. <laughs> Not quite working the way I'd like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he wasn't feeling good that day, R2-D2, he had a kind of a bad throat. <laughs> he was slurring his speech, too, but we're not going to assume anything. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> So Joshua. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, uh, you look naked. You have no piano around I you. Have, uh, <laughs> man of a few words. There's nothing for you to lunge at. Nothing. To plot. Nothing. To strike. No. To, no. To tinkle. To. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> be careful when you say that word. <laughs> um, we agreed to leave our big axes home. Uh, I was thinking of taking that Ukrainian club that was brought to me as a, by you know, one of my house guests. Oh yes, I remember but that. But I thought you might feel threatened by it, and I, I, I thought that may not be the way to Possibly. go. Possibly. 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 All right, so I think uh, uh, 
unless you have something burning, let's uh, move on to uh, introduce yes. uh, our first guest, who is um, internationally recognized for his nimble fingers, among other things. He is a microtonal virtuoso. Mm -hmm. um, his name is John Cattler. some purples, some greens, and some blues for you. And uh, it's because normally uh, people think of you as Willie McBlind. I mean, is that normal or what? That's not normal, no. no. It's not normal. Can you see? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actually legally blind. I, I could never be drafted, but I wear strong contact lenses now. I, I didn't mean to pry. I really... I, I know, Johnny would be friends a long time, so <laughs> since 1981, actually. Yeah, I mean, this is a guy who literally knocked on my door and said, I heard you put an ad in the Soho News looking for an interested microtonalist. Well, in those days, there were two free papers, the Village Voice and the Soho News. And Johnny and I, in all these years, have only ever taken out one ad looking for musicians. It happened to be the same week, one in one paper and one in the other paper back in 1981. And it was a... a a uh, uh, movie composer, Jack Eric Williams, who told me, oh, you must be cahoot in cahoots with the other guy in the paper looking for a microtonal musicians. Yeah, it's this is just the amazing uh, synchronizing of two people lost in the microtonal wilderness. And I was coming from a pedestrian quarter tone perspective. And he was coming from erase that completely and start over again with 31 equal temperament. Well, Johnny had told me, he said, I, you know, I, I appreciate that you have a 31 tone equal temper guitar, but he said, I can only play quarter tones on the bassoon. And I said, well, what about this note? And he, he fiddled around with the fingers, and lo and behold, he, he got the pitch. But I was surprised because I never considered myself a math person, and here I'm saying, I see 31, does it go into 24? Is there anything in common? And then he said, one note, and I felt grateful. <laughs> but then he switched it on me. He wanted to match the... 60 cycle hum. He threw everything that I had into the wastebasket. Well, this was years start, later. Yeah, okay, years later. I had to start all over again, all the notes, because he wanted to start 41 cents flatter. Well, you know, the, the, the hum is ubiquitous. It's in the room now, it's a turn of fan. Where's that it's, it's just the, the 60 cycle hum is just everywhere, especially if you're a guitar player. They, you know, you're dealing with hum all the time. It's nice to play in tune with it instead of fighting it, and that way, you know, you reduce the vibration between you and the hum. You're not fighting it, it's kind of supporting you, it's playing in tune with you. Power chords, that's the first heard the term, <laughs> power chords. Yes, bassoon is not going threaten visually. <laughs> but we did plug his bassoon into a guitar amp and got it to distort like a guitar. Yeah, I don't know if they all know this, but we, we played in a rock band together with the creative name of uh, JC and the Microtones. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, that was a 31 tone rock band. And and it, it, evolved. it evolved. It went into right. a much more complex, powerful role uh, in the world of music as the Microtones. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> then it was. Well, the Microtones. There were probably a number of different. You like to go through different characters. Well, you know, to me, microtone music is not a style, and it's important to show that you can play, you know, rock, jazz, blues, classical, avant-garde, uh, pop music, anything That's with, sure. using microtones. And I think people think of it as this avant-garde thing, but really, you can use it for all different styles of music, as some of the composers here tonight, you know, understand. Uh, what do you do musically that's different when you're Willie McBlind? Well, Willie McBlind is a blues band that I put together with my partner, Babe Borden, uh, back in 2006, and we put out uh, our third record this year. And uh, Willie McBlind is a, you know, the, the blues has always existed between the cracks. Back then, those guys in the, in the 30s, when the, or before when blues was being developed, it was some guy in a field with an acoustic guitar, no electric tuner, and he was, you know, playing to an open tuning, and he was singing on top of that, and using a slide on top of that. So there was no temperament, it was just what sounded right to him. Well, there was temperament. 
Well, they were not the right. person would be angry, the person would be hungry, the person attack. would like to go chase somebody. That's true, it was a they personal temperament, like not a twelfth unequal temperament. Right, they could be, you know, temperamental of all kinds. <laughs> right. And yeah. we have to combine that. This is multiplication, everybody. I mean, I learned that in math. We're multiplying here. Yeah. So let me, let me get this straight. Playing in microtones. Everybody thinks, what is this thing, microtones? It's like some weird thing, you know? We don't play in tune, or we play out of tune. Which is it? You guys are comfortable in tune and out of tune, right? Well, then you have to identify what is in tune, and you know, nature has kind of done that for us. The reason that Josh Pierce McMahon sounds different than John Reinhard Carson, <laughs> even if they sing the same A note, is because... Who are you calling an A note? <laughs> <laughs> you know, nature has taken care of that and has supplied the, the voice or every sound with the harmonic series. And the amount of harmonics in Josh's voice are different than the harmonic balance in Johnny's voice or in all of our voices. Well, there's no harmonics. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's why you can call up your mother and say, hey, and she knows right away who it is because nature has taken care of that. Mm -hmm. So there is a standard of being in tune, and it's called harmonic series. And we can either go along with that, or we can you know, divide the octave differently and go against that. Or we can take the harmonic series and go up very high and get pitches that really rub against each other like some of the pitches that uh, we'll play later. Yeah, I wish you'd look this way a little bit. I know you don't think you're really on television, but I'm talking to you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, I thought I would share with the audience, you know, what we do is when we, we combine all tunings together, we come up with a threshold of about one cent. And so I thought I would demonstrate for you one cent, which is a very, very rare occurrence. Um, just take a moment to remember the last time somebody demonstrated one cent to you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you know how we have the perfect fifth, which isn't perfect? I know, I'm losing my credibility immediately, aren't I? So if I go... This is what is drilled into the university conservatory students in what they call solfege and ear training. It's one, five, five, one, excuse me. So but if you go to the Wizard of Oz, which is where I, that's my basis. Yes, I am. For all musical things. <laughs> and and you, you know those monkey soldiers that go around the Wicked Witch of the West? The monkey oh, soldiers. soldiers. Yeah, the monkey soldiers. The monkey they, monkey go, soldiers. they go, right. oh, we go, oh, we go. Right, the monkey soldiers. Right? Now, that's this. So what we're going to do, we're going to isolate the monkey soldier from the conservatory. <laughs> okay, here's the monkey soldier. Here is the conservatory. That's two cents. That's worth my two cents. That's a schisma. I will now divide the schisma in half. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That's going down. How many could tell it was going down? That's what I thought. <laughs> what a business I made. <laughs> All right, I'll do this differently this time. I will go down further, and I will go so far down. Don't make it to the bottom of how far down I've gone. You'll never get up. I will compare it to what I started with. It could be flat bottom. And there should be some leap of faith there. Up or down. Here we go. Starting at the top. Did you hear that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, you can hear a difference. Are you all heard that? No. Now. <laughs> no. theory, okay, like the theory of evolution, okay? Just a theory. Could you maybe produce a unusually fretted instrument? I mean, it's still stressed out, it's fretted, 
and it's got strings under a lot of stress. And you probably stretch them every day, torture them into place. And you make them hold their position in a torturous shape overnight. This is what I've heard. <laughs> you really are into those monkey soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yes, I guess we consider ourselves friendless. We don't worry too much about you know, those things. Everything's slightly out of tune. Are you friendless even when there's frets? Yes. Even when there's frets, there's never enough frets. On my Justin guitar, I got 64 notes in the octave. It's still nowhere near enough. You have to learn to bend within those. So basically, you're always kind of playing fretless. And if somebody is playing with you, are they, they, your, are they your brother? Is that a true question? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, sure. They're your musical brother, sure. Uh -huh. And that's why I can present Fretless Brothers, my first commercial of the evening. Wow. <laughs> Fretless Brothers by John Kaplan. <laughs> no frets except for the frets. And no brothers except for the brother. Right. Actually, everybody on the record is guys I've played with for years, and they all play fretless instruments, but on this record, they're playing fretted instruments called the uh, 12-tone Ultra Plus. And this is a system where they told me for 20 years it couldn't be done. They said, you can't mix harmonic series with 12 to equal temperament. They're on the opposite ends of the spectrum. So it took me about 20 years before this formula dawned on me of how to insert harmonic series pitches into equal temperament. And they're not tempered pitches. They're actually pure harmonics of the equal tempered pitches. And we call this system 12 to ultra plus, And it adds one extra harmonic series fret in between the standard frets that are already on the guitar. So you can still play every Beatles song you normally play, but then you have the option of also playing these harmonic frets. You know, I'm a big Beatles fan. I have this million-year-old fossil that I carry with me everywhere, this wonderful Beatle. I, really, I, I was really planning on bringing it. I, I, was, I just can't believe I left it home, frankly. But, um, so you're going but, um, to eat these days, huh? But, uh, the idea, though, is that you create something musically that is greater than actually what you're doing. No, I don't think that's the idea. Well, they're fretless brothers, and there's no frets, and there's frets, and there's no brother, but it's bigger than fretless brothers. No so. need to fret. Yeah, we just didn't oh, worry about it. Uh, just didn't, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't worry about it. Don't Don't fret fret it. Don't switch to something else already. All right, take well, what we did was we played a harmonic series jazz. In other words, we had microtonal chord changes that were moving, and we played oh, you know, heads, and solos, heads and solos over that, oh. which they said you, know, you couldn't do harmonic series jazz because harmonic series is based out of one fundamental. But when you apply harmonic series and mix it with equal temperament, you can play harmonic series jazz. So that's what that particular record is. It's okay, I, I'm serious playing, serious asking to hear the serious. Sure, yeah. I can, so I can play something. Please. Seriously. Let's hear it. John Cattler playing serious.
Okay, join us. Um, maybe uh, scoot down a little bit there, Ed. And uh, he thinks it's the Ed show, you know. I anyway, I gotta remind him. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, we have a uh, wonderful opportunity to invite a complete stranger to John Kaplan, his partner, Meredith Borden. These are my eyes, okay? Look here. <laughs> Those are her eyes, John. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, uh, one day, Meredith just knocked on my door. <laughs> Everybody knocks on his door. <laughs> I can tell them they're not, though, which one to answer. But anyway, <laughs> I, uh, actually, the, the real truth is, I put these two in a hotel in Switzerland. <laughs> Switzerland and Switzerland. Well, well, not the same room. She knocked on my door. <laughs> There's a long story. I heard rumors story about the knockies on the doors in the hotel. Yes. It's true. And lost luggage. Uh, Josh Pierce. Right yeah. man. Yes, uh, yes, he well, was there. Tell them what was in Josh's luggage. Yeah, so we got to Zurich oh, and yes. uh, we're in, get, get back to our little bed and breakfast. And uh, Was it Zurich we started? Or, or some other little town it, in Germany? We started in Kreuzlingen. Kreuzlingen. <laughs> And Joshua Pierce McMahon comes screaming out of his room. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, I have the wrong suitcase, it's full of ladies' lingerie! <laughs> <laughs> so he had snatched the wrong luggage by mistake. So he had to wear the lingerie the whole time. Yes. So <laughs> did he wear it? It kicked that tour off to a very interesting start. <laughs> uh, how did you get started? I heard there's something about this legendary figure, though who was a round figure. Uh, yes. Joseph and Mary. Right. Was so, he really the, did he put the microtones in the uh, solution? Absolutely. He was the start for me with microtonal music. It's in Boston, right? Yeah, New England Conservatory of Music. Um, I was a grad student in the opera di division, and um, I heard about this, this wacky guy that did microtonal music, and so I... Smacked I, everybody around? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, he was an interesting guy. Uh -huh. And um, a lot of my friends were in the third stream department. Uh, swimming, were they swimming upstream? They were swimming all kinds of streams, uh -huh. up, down, and sideways, every the musical stream. The horn players there, right? The yeah, it was a really interesting mix of people, a lot of whom ended up with you. Um, oh, yeah, Chris yeah. Washburn, yeah, Chris Washburn, I can name a whole bunch, Ed Brahms, um, who else, uh, Al Giusto, all kinds of people that we all kind of gravitated mm. towards this guy because he was just so interesting, for one thing, musically interesting. Well, he spoke in tongues. Did you learn any of those languages? Uh, yeah, he had some really, he channeled, for sure. And as I told Johnny when I first sought Johnny out when I came to New York after I'd gotten the microtonal bug, that, I, that, was, that was one of the biggest things he taught me was just how to kind of channel the energy because the microtonality was almost like a side thing. It was more a language. Now he was in 72 tone music. 72 tone equal. So it wasn't until I met this guy that I was introduced to just intonation and all that. And uh, so, you know, it was, it's kind of a path for me, you know, starting with 72 equal and learning how to subdivide the half step into six pitches. Um, and that was really cool. It was just, you know, opening your ear to the fact that there's so much in between a half step. Just that by itself was like, wow. You know, what did it do to you to have this new clarification of just intonation on top of a template of 72 equal temperament? Well, there were two separate things, I think. One was more of a linear language that was more disjunct and almost disconnected from harmony. And then, I guess, do, you know, when I first started with, working with you, it was sort of the Harry Parch thing, which was, you know, rooted in just, so that was kind of like the stepping stone. We did the potion scene. Yeah, that was wonderful, wonderful stuff. With Anastasia will be on later. And yes, we, uh, Anastasia. We did what else, the James um, Joyce piece? The pieces. James Joyce, um, Wonderful Widow of Sixteen Springs, and um, you know, that was, that, was, that was sort of my like christening into into the world of But you have this other side to you. Yes, you, you what like other to, side? Mm. Well, I mean, when, when, <laughs> When uh, Willie over there is with you singing, yes. you're a babe. Yes, well, that's, mean, yes. Well, we, we went through many different stages of that, too. We started off with, well, you know, oh, this, there's so many um, backtracking. 
Um, I first met John Catler when we went to Europe with Microtone Festival, and um, to sing with the Microtones, which you mentioned earlier. And then from there, John once one evening said, "Well, what do you want to do?" And I thought, "I want to sing like the birds." So that's where we started with our project Birdhouse, which was all microtonal transcriptions of bird song, and that was our first release, um, which was a really cool project. And then from there, yeah. <laughs> Olivia Messiaen and all that kind of cool stuff um, was an inspiration for that project. Um, and then we went on to Electric Birdhouse, which then went to Gothic Swallow, that <laughs> went on to, okay, the way flying, the blues. So that's how that went. And went. the next one, the turkey bird. The turkey bird. <laughs> 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 who knows what's next, you know? Oh, no. Well, that uh, sounds great, and I love the way you say who knows what's next, because, you know, that yeah. gives us the excitement of change and originality, and uh, yeah. that's what I, I know you guys both most for. And, and I just want to say that Johnny Reinhardt is a matchmaker. He, ha he deserves credit for that because, uh, because of our awareness. So, yeah. He is a matchmaker. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we ended up having a micro romance. Which is, which is a micromance. <laughs> I was thinking about this, yeah, a micromance, which has lasted Micromancia. for the better part of 20 years now, because actually it, it lasted was in huh? 1993 that we met. So this is a 20 year anniversary of our micromance. Wow. Uh, and let's point out that uh, uh, John Callow, 1981, first concert, he was on that concert. Josh, 1982. Do you remember your year? 1982? Yeah, he's 1982. Oh, my first year was probably 1991, because that's when I moved to New York. Yeah. Just to give us a yeah. uh, sense of depth. Yep. How about something original with the two of you? Okay. Sure. I think we can do that. Let's hear something else. Right. <laughs> this is a really cool mic, by the way. So it's very vintage. Very vintage. But I'm not going to use it. <laughs> I don't think I need it. Right? I leave it to you. I told you, John.
much I'd like to say thank you to John Catler. Thank you. Anastasia Soberg. was on the first festival in 1981. Wow. Anastasia yeah. Soberg, tell me, what did you play on that night? <laughs> <laughs> Something with the oboe and bassoon. It begins with the M, and it's Italian. Are you being heard? I don't know. Yes. Yes? Mm -hmm. Picking up nicely? OK. Oh. You could do that. The microphone. I don't like microphones. Now, I thought you were going to be dressed as the Mad Hatter. I thought about that. I was I misinformed? Uh, you were not misinformed. You decided to become conservative. Uh, <laughs> when? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I told you I'm not good at math, but there's a lot of years there. When did it happen? I missed it. <laughs> Okay. Well, this is the conservative look. You know, the first three letters of conservative, conservative are con. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, this is getting bad. <laughs> well, okay, so I, I remember you doing all sorts of set pieces. <laughs> I remember that you were influenced heavily by Celi Yes. This is a Romanian composer who insisted on taking things slower than it's other conductor, people. conductor, darling. Yes, That's excuse conductor. me. He must have written something. Not <laughs> <laughs> I know of. That doesn't mean he didn't write something. That's very true. <laughs> you know, you can't assume. <laughs> no, I shouldn't, should I? Right, of course. So, you but he did like things slow. Yeah, but he didn't like them slow. He liked them fast. He liked them fast. He liked them fast. He liked not necessarily. Not necessarily. Did he dress as a man of matter, for example? No, but he did a lot of dancing. I gotta talk to my people about this. I'm getting the wrong. If he did dancing? Yes. He used to dance. He used to be that. Could you show us? <laughs> no. <laughs> Those days are over. There were days? <laughs> Again. How did I miss them? I, I can talk about our apartment in Spanish Harlem if you like. I keep it too. It's a burning issue for you. <laughs> what street? I don't even remember. I was drunk. But there was an oboe player there. <laughs> and I'm assumed. Oh, there was Sarah. Aren't you a group librarian? <laughs> <laughs> if I ever was home. Well, she did introduce me to someone she just mentioned just now who then uh, went to a kibbutz and... Uh, no, she went... She didn't go to a kibbutz? She was she the man had her? <laughs> she immigrated to Israel, but she was married. They were, they were she wasn't married to a kibbutz, is what you're trying to say? <laughs> no, she was within an enclave. I'm kibbutzing you. Oh, God. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, terrible, I know. <laughs> okay, anyway. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> it's really hard to coordinate these things. Oh, That's why there are two O's in coordinate. Let them speak, John. I was going to ask you, were you living on the west or the east side? Let me get this straight. Well, first we shared a railroad apartment on uh -huh. the east side. I was the caboose. <laughs> oh, no. That was with Jeunesse. Anybody here know Jeunesse? We heard rumors. <laughs> Yes. There have been rumors. There have been some. You and Jeunesse and I, right? There were rumors of such. I don't such remember much else. <laughs> Those were the days. And then? Well, well, tell me what you did with your viola. What did I, what did I do with my viola? What did you do to your viola? I mean, with your viola. <laughs> what did you do with viola? That play her do. <laughs> Harry Parch's music. Harry Parch, but with I perfect pitch, he was hammering brads in between the strings so he could find the notes. And she never hammered any brads into mm -hmm. her viola. Mm -hmm. What's going on here? You don't need brads. She doesn't need <laughs> a bow but, knife. But the reality in is... In umbo and dambo. The Tell reality us. is Harry Parch put a cello neck on his viola. And therefore he had the space in order to mathematically divide it up. I think it was part of the evolvement of understanding his division of the octave. So he could actually be exact with it. I've got, I've got to guess. Well, I don't really guess, actually. I practice a lot. <clears throat> she does. Uh, I would suggest uh, it's worth mentioning right now that 
all of the people who play Harry Potter's music in our organization, uh, the American Festival of Microtonal Music, soon to be the IFMM, <laughs> um, we don't have perfect pitch. Uh, Harry Potter did have perfect pitch. Uh, his singers and uh, the new band singers, to my knowledge, have all had perfect pitch. So we actually provide a different take. I guess. You could see it that way. Otherwise, I we're going to hammer your viola with some brads very soon. I also mm -hmm. uh, reinterpret Harry Parch's music a little bit. Now, Johnny might throw something at me, but never mind. Um, I think that a lot of his was uh, impressionistic, some of his going from one note to the other. Um, how he gets there. It wasn't about getting there with the specific notes. It was about the direction there and a the movement that he was trying to show. So what is more important to show that movement or to find each single little you note know, in between? And if you hear any of his recordings, some of the things he plays are so fast. You know that he didn't do. <laughs> so... Um, I try to use, incorporate that in a lot of the way that I play his music. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that Harry Potter's music began as completely, 100% based on American English speech. Correct. It, it was not based on harmony. Correct. And so he had many different numbers, but he, he was convinced that human beings were incapable of understanding infinity. So then he latched on to number 43, mm -hmm. just so people would have something to hold on to. Mm. And uh, once you started creating harmony, the proof is that his instruments were inharmonic. He was building percussion that, <coughs> I'm putting on my science hat for a second if you don't mind. Uh, he was dealing with mass that didn't vibrate evenly throughout. And so that's how you get these non-harmonic pitches and, uh, you know, he studied electric guitar. It was a, just an amplified instrument. He has a, a measure and a half of improv. He, he anticipates so many things um, uh, of the future, but he's locked into a period of time where everything's made with glue. You can't even take the, the instruments apart. You know, you need a big truck. So uh, Anastasia used uh, some uh, good ingenuity to find a way around it. What were, were his dates, Eric Parsons? Um, he was born in 1963, I think. He was born in 1900. He died in 1974. Mm -hmm. I, I saw him at the Whitney in 68. Mm -hmm. uh, he, well, we'll probably touch on him again. He's one of the American pioneers. He's, uh, he's certainly the most prominent American pioneer. Uh, what makes the IFMN so delicious is that there were pioneers in different countries at this time. And with the internet and the whole world, we're coming one family. We're so close together. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh, the whole microtonal world! <laughs> John, I, I don't understand based on American speech. That's a really interesting idea. Well, he, he was a bum. I know that. And if you read his, uh, his, his diaries, I have. he wrote in there how he would, the people who were singing or chanting or talking, he would hear the intonation of the words. And he started, that's where his whole microtonal idea came from. From how do I put on paper the intonations of the way these people are speaking? How do I get those notes? And that's where it evolved. That's the true Harry Potter. Okay. Everything else comes from this. And this is missing. Uh, it's a big, it's, a, it's missing for a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. what were your greatest experiences on the festival? You've had 33 years. What, I, what would you and say are your greatest Johnny knows I have a terrible memory. And she doesn't smile that often either. <laughs> no, I'm expecting a laugh. I want some laughs. She's really good at that. Um, growling? Uh, let's see. I, I liked the Zanakis that I played. That should tell you something, okay? Her favorite is Zanakis. <laughs> I'm not trying to cast aspersions here, okay? No, I, I am. am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> um, um, I, I really, the, the part is my baby, and I rewrote everything, and I've worked everything. And he would deny it. <laughs> Blanche would deny it. <laughs> okay, I'm not old enough. But, but I feel like he's part of me, 
and I wish there was more parts that I could play and more parts I could get my hold of. I really enjoyed working uh, Brother for that performance in Norway that we did. Um, Dark Brother. Dark Brother, yes. But that was a great, great piece. That's part of my experience with the Irish parts was this chromolodeon, playing the chromolodeon, because it was on an electric piano. But it was such a phenomenal thing to do this and to hear the harmonies. And I think one of the great pieces in U.S. highball. That was a phenomenal piece to play. Just the keyboard part. It was a virtuoso, pianistic keyboard part. And you heard these tones, and you were not locked into anything that was equal tempered. It was just, it was just incredible. I remember we had a lot of great greatest experiences in my life. It was, uh, and John Cadler joined us on that. Yes, it's phenomenal. Um, it, what was uh, fascinating to me at the time, and not putting a smile on my face, are the conceptions that um, using an electronic instrument for Harry Parts' piece was a no-no. Uh, though that's a Luigi Nono was a completely different composer. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. But uh <laughs> it's not <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But uh, in doing research, wouldn't you know there was a time capsule that was dug up ten years after Parch passed, so nineteen eighty four. And in the time capsule is this brilliant electronic organ designed like flat in colors. That's what he wanted. And the world hadn't produced it yet. I mean, you know, the history of the uh, electronic world is uh, Bell Telephone in uh, 1880 or 90. They had something for three months and then they jumped it for parts. Nobody knew what to do with this city long synthesizer. Right? And nobody did anything with it except a very expensive to buy dissertation, which I can't afford. Mm -hmm. And then the theorem. All of a sudden, boom, you know, a guy who invented the doors that open in supermarkets, you know, a guy who's responsible for 80% of the Russian space industry, a uh, guy who invented the bridges that are translucent that you can still put the car over but they haven't made yet. What? Yeah. The pyramid did do that. Yeah, wait. You all know, the, the papers that are hidden on him, who knows? I, I know the Perry biography. Well, there's, there's the family, too. We'll talk. Okay. But the brilliant guy who basically invented the bug. You know, they invented the bug. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, know, you want to know what his enemies and you want to hear what you're saying? He invented the bug without electricity. Uh -huh. not, not electric bug. Right, not electric bug. <laughs> I thought all bugs were not electric, but okay. <laughs> I'm not going to criticize. <laughs> uh, yes, he was a, a, a quite amazing. Finally, let out of prison for the crime of being a scientist. You know, it's a horrible crime. And uh, he comes back to America. He's uh, 95 years old, and he bumps into the guy who invented the uh, synthesizer that caught on, Bob Moog. And uh, excuse me, because I'm tired. And uh, then he uh, is told. I, got a, I, I, I don't know his Russian accent, but you know, I got a good idea for you. <laughs> <laughs> you should try making mood synthesizers for diamonds. And actually, it, it, it caught on. You can't still buy a theremin in a store, as far as I know, but <clears throat> you can still, thanks to Bob Moog, find one on the internet. So that's a nice thing. Mm -hmm. Anastasia, it's yes. such a pleasure to have you join us as one Thank of our you. tried and true great oh, soldiers of music. Okay, so now Joshua, come over here, Mr. Ed McMahon. Oh, you're the man, McMahon. And uh, tell us what's going to go on. Don't you need your microphone? No, you're over there. You're over there. Over here? Yeah, okay. Yeah, be comfortable. We've got a whole right. Okay. <laughs> So, um, <clears throat> I'm supposed to be, uh, who am I supposed to be? Anybody got a hat? Oh, perfect, thank you. Uh, this is the one I was hoping for. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's <laughs> <laughs> the wrong angle? Uh, are we moving on? Where are the other ways? 
you can see the you can see the front of it. A beaver. Uh -huh. I believe it. This is a beaver. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, but I, I kind of like it here. You want it? Everybody looks good. Finished. Okay. So uh, we're moving on. On Karnak. Karnak. Karnak the magnificent. <coughs> Karnak knows everything. He knows the answer to everything, especially in microtonality. So here we are. Here we Question are. number one. The title of his greatest composition is now the name of Futurama's sexy Cyclops cartoon superstar. He published that microtones were an impossibility in music because whole new instruments would be necessary and a brand new notation system was needed. Who was Mr. Magoo? No, who was? No, 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 no. What's his was? name? Oh, you wait, know. oh, wait, it's coming to me, but it's, it's in another language. The composer of Olivia Messian. Yes. Tarangalila. Tarangalila. If you haven't seen her, she's very He's cute. amazing. Just she. amazing. I got another one for you. Just one eye. Go ahead. I got a couple for you. I'm hearing. I got two ears. His oh. autopsy revealed lifelong syphilis. Really? And after living in every single state in the United States, a percussionist would fashion his legacy. Who is he? You all know. We just spent the last half hour talking about him. Who is? Harry Parch. Harry yes. Parch! <laughs> <laughs> Give him a roll. Give him a roll. That's it. Excellent. That was a roll? It's more like a fail. I know, especially if you're using a wrench to make a roll. <laughs> now, here's something. Right tool. I don't know if you're going to get this. But I'm going to try and stump you. Okay. Go ahead, stump me. He was a hunchback intersexual who pulled seeds from behind him to make things grow. All the time playing his flute in long journeys through Mexico and throughout the West. He had two antennae and is often used as a logo. Well, I thought it might be this character. Can't see it. Can't what see is it? it? Uh, Woody Woodpecker? No. <laughs> no? You know, uh... <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. <laughs> it turns out to be, uh... uh Coco Pelly. Right. Yes! yes. Coco Pelly. Coco Pelly. Uh, the forerunner of Johnny Appleseed. A, another Johnny. Another Johnny. Part of my family. A wanderer. We know We're not that many hunchbacks, but I wouldn't sure. tell you if I did, but shh. <laughs> oh, here's one. This is, this is a great one. You'll probably get this. Uh-oh, now I'm under pressure. Uh, are we going to segue to a commercial soon? I'm having a great pressure. He made millions, became America's greatest music philanthropist. For Lou Harrison, John Cage, and probably for other composers as well. And he asked that all his copyrights be, for his songs, be waived. No copyrights. In other words, he did not make any money from his songs. Who is he? Charles Ives. Absolutely. Yes. The first four hands up, get a free universe symphony of Charles Ives. I have a, I have a, I <laughs> that is a fantastic <laughs> I thought it was Stephen Foster. Yeah, this is a great record if anybody doesn't know it. Thank you. Charles Ives. Yeah, this is all true stuff. This is all true stuff. Um, amazing man in a lot of respects. And um, maybe I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, make a commercial. Excellent. Uh, it's uh, <coughs> This just came out. It's called Charles Ives and his Road to the Stars. I didn't write it, <coughs> but I wrote the forward, so I'm a liar. 
I mean, even a copy edited a word or two, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so sue me. But I'm really pleased it exists because this fellow, Anthony Cook, uh, who I never met, except virtually, is uh, somebody who analyzed the recording and the material that I did and liked my conclusion, so I have to be happy. <laughs> and so uh, finally, uh, for the first time, actually, uh, a very difficult situation for me, which is no one trusted what I had to say. Because after all, I was biased. Uh, finally, an independent person put material together, analyzes it, helps you hear it, and um, deals with all the uh, issues at hand. Uh, it's just becoming available now. It may not even be available today. It will be within a day or two, probably. It's on Amazon.com. It's published by Estrella Books. So it's, it's on Create Space? It's to help actually uh, you hear all of Ives' music, not just the universe, though that's like a fifth of the book. And uh, you should be able to find it by just Googling Cook, C O O K E, Anthony, no H. Ives. And uh, yeah, Charles Ives and just, and just Charles Ives. Yes, Cook slash I Ives. found it. You'll find it. It's there. What you want to tell me just quickly what's the difference between your, yours and Larry Austin's? Night and day. That's, that's a good way to begin. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally different. Totally different. So um, that's why I'm very pleased about this, and he will talk about the others, and it's not for me to do anymore. That's been the big uh, challenge. It's not for me to do. Thank you very much. Very interesting stuff. Under $20. It's a wonderful book. I've read some of the chapters. It's just great. Um, <coughs> Institute. Uh, we were in the home of Patch Adams, the yes. medical doctor slash clown. Fabulous place nestled in the low mountains of West Virginia. And if you record there, you get a whole orchestra of free insects, like and birds. Oh my God! You don't have to pay them or anything, and you know they're, <laughs> they're not. You know, they're really good. I mean, they're uncountable. I mean, you couldn't have a feast of sound like that. It's like. Uh, well, you don't get into the city, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I've noticed crickets. You're waiting for the cicadas? Are you waiting I for the cicadas? cicadas? You love them? Yeah. When was the last time you saw them? 17 years ago. You think they remember you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I think I'm quite insignificant. <laughs> Is that right? To a cicada. That's a, what a title. Insignificant to a cicada. <laughs> Great. So this area has kind of a, a melange of all different types of insects and birds, and you get these incredible sounds. Is that what you're saying? Well, we're, we're I think we're just commenting on uh, the lovely sounds of the the natural habitat. Oh, uh, we're keeping them. Are we going to tell them where it is? Uh, I forget the name of the town. It was well, let's just start with the yes. state. <laughs> West, West Virginia. Virginia. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I remember one night sleeping in the yurt. <laughs> I pulled something off my neck like this dick and I slapped it to the side. Another time some huge elongated thing was crawling up a wall. We had bear for lunch. <laughs> this was a place beyond belief. I had to put rubber bands on my bassoon to keep the keys down. <laughs> it was, they were get overheated in the day, and at night they freeze out of place. <laughs> so I find it took a while to figure out the, the you know, the, the trends, so that I could like, put the rubber bands on to keep them in the right place. Yeah, it was a slightly <laughs> rough place, but uh, it wasn't that uncomfortable for sure. No, it wasn't, and it was a, a nice pleasure to, to meet you. And then what happened? How did I bump into you again? 
Oh my god. That's right. No, he had nothing to do with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a theological expression. <laughs> uh, you, were, you were teaching music to my daughter in the public school. I know. And you know how I met And she school? comes home and she says, Hey, Daddy, I had this teacher who gave me a CD. He's like you, or something like that. Uh oh. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, she wore uh, Oh, Johnny Reinhardt. Did she tell you how she got the CD? Well, she did. I forget. I just remember you saying she you will just never forget. It toward she her. will never forget. Can I tell you? Tell me. She was a really. She, I, I know she was that. enraptured with you. I had heard that there were some of these classes, first and second grade, that had a little bit of noise problem. Oh. Okay. They weren't always perfect kids. So I came up with this thought for a lesson plan. Everyone in the class has to put a chair on the table with absolutely not a drop of sound. Mm. And then when they, if they manage that, and the whole class is the witness, and they do four at a time, and they're tough. If they hear a sound, believe me, they let you know it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then we had to put the chairs down. And in her class, one girl and one boy won, and she was the girl. Huh. So then, of course, I hand her a CD. She brings it over to Dad. Dad writes to me and goes, Ah, what are you doing to my kids? <laughs> <laughs> you forgot that, right? <laughs> it's unjust. <laughs> it was unjust? It was unjust, yes. Oh, I thought you said he's an unjust composer. <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm looking to make news. <laughs> Joe Maneri did call himself an unjust composer. Yeah. I'm practically critical. <laughs> because 72 equal is, you know, not a lot of justice there. Mm. Yeah. Well, but you're, you're really a poly just. I mean, you're, you're uh, extended. Yeah. Doesn't he look extended? <laughs> <laughs> He's wearing extensions. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how do you extend? I mean, you don't do it with tools. <laughs> a lot of musicians just, you know, they extend with tools. He's a cappella. <laughs> so, well, he's how do you extend? <laughs> I suppose he's MIDI tracks to help learn the stuff. Okay, so he, he tracks. Uh -huh. um, uh, I'm working with Ben Johnston's notation as a starting point, and going from there and just. So any note could be any other note in any other dimension in any one particular way. No, there, there are. <laughs> no, it's, it's like uh, extended lattices, you know, there are chains of intervals that. I, lattice. I, yeah, I'm really interested in. That's a tool. Moving around. The lattice is a tool, right? Yeah, a lattice is a theoretical tool, for uh -huh. sure. So uh, you do some amazing things vocally. I mean, he's very, you know, like Clark Kentish, you know, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then he comes out with these superpowers, you know, and, and everybody's blown away. Well, you're really uh, raising expectations here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's really not that good, okay? <laughs> Everything they say has been overblown. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 uh, I, I love all the things that human voice can do and composing with as much of it. And non-human voices are not as interesting. Oh, well, they are. It's just I can't necessarily compose them and get them to do what okay. I want. And, and we did, of course, uh, have another interaction besides his daughter putting chairs on tables. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot already. I conducted what? your piece. Uh, <laughs> You're yeah. saying it. <laughs> there were a whole bunch of people on stage. Do you remember? <laughs> well, some of these people were there. Possibly so. Yes. Possibly so. Yeah. All right, so, you know, I hope there'll be more of it. And then there was. Oh, you, what, the... the uh, That's it? Open rehearsal? Open rehearsal. Yeah. I had no idea there was a performance. It turned out to be in Florida. Oh, yeah. He, he has them come from Florida to New York to rehearse and then they go back home. <laughs> <laughs> no, they did the other way around. Okay. It's and I heard you do this miraculous bandering type solo. And I was shocked. When he said to me, Mandarin? Well, I'm just giving an adjective. Okay. I was shocked <laughs> that it was 
described by our guest as not microtonal. Okay. You should know that I have muddied the water for many years and consider all music microtonal. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, taking the 12-inch ruler, speaking, yes. you know, against the octave, and there were some people who would even besmirch the octave, though I may not be one of them. You know, there are people who like it a little longer, a little shorter. And um, well, I was thinking, you know, still in terms of you know, periodic pitch. Well, I know you from Yuri DC. Wonderful album. There's my pitch. I'm not talking about my label right now, but <laughs> this is a great album, Yuri DC. Mainly because I'm now convinced I know how to pronounce it. You know, I, I went to the off actually, Orfeo and all those uh, actually the, 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 the I'm not playwright, sure. the playwright Sarah Rule pronounces it Eurydice. I guess it's an American, an American pronunciation. All the singers I work with are like Eurydice. They're so used to singing it in Italian. So now I have no more comfort zone. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could pretty much say her name however you wish. Eurydice. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, some are easier to pronounce than that. That's a, that, but it's amazing the group that he has. I mean, they're not here, but uh, it's a, a wonderful ensemble. They, they are, are good, aren't they? Uh, yeah, yeah, they really so. are good. And um, I think you need to hear something that this man is going to do because otherwise he looks like you know. If you don't mind my saying, is we just dragged you in from the street. <laughs> and you're a nice guy. You live in New York. You're bright, good-looking chap. Well, thank you. Jeff. But we're going out later. That is not why he's here. <laughs> <laughs> you have to clear that with my daughter. <laughs> All right, we'll work it out. I'll have my people call your people. Uh, would you consider uh, singing that beautiful solo? Sure. Okay. You know, if you want to add microtones, because of some sense of guilt. Well, like it's you're interesting already what you were saying about Parch. You know, I, I didn't realize how much uh, his ear was awakened to microtones through speech, but of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, what 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 got your mark, microtone? Well, um, I had studied with Ben Johnston okay. at the University of Illinois, and so you got together, you started a fire, you started going microtones, microtones, <laughs> something like that. Well, no, I mean he he, he played uh, some of his music for me, and he had a scalatron in his office. He had a scalatron. Yeah. Anybody out there know what a scalatron is? French. <laughs> All right, so that's an instrument that had its tone picked because it sounded like nothing else. <laughs> but it was um, way over my head. and um, That's only if you're on your knees. And then I, <laughs> I finished my lessons with Ben. And, um, that's good that you didn't run out early. <laughs> and I just remember listening to the flute and absolutely loving the pitches. <laughs> and I thought... Pitch love, okay? We got pitch <laughs> love here. <laughs> well, it, I... I I thought, I really you my bitch! <laughs> you my bitch! <laughs> so I decided to get to know that bitch. That's uh, right. So I did, I did, I did, I did, I did a study as an undergraduate student in microtonal music and it kicked my ass. That was a He's a bass, it's close. <laughs> I'm giving you the long-winded answer here. I started doing a lot of a cappella work with, with singers here in New York. And Did you ever misspell that word, a cappella? Oh, no, but there are two acceptable spellings. Oh, my goodness. I did not know that. Uh, okay. Don't, it's okay. You don't need to tell me. Uh, well, anyway, me just after singing with all these people, and, in, and for a while, I, I worked as Ben's copyist. And editor. So that's when I really got this technique. You follow Ben around and you try to look just like him? <laughs> <laughs> Thank God, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> you work from a photograph. <laughs> no, it, that's, that's what taught me the technique. So okay. just copying his scores okay. Okay. And, 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 and mimicking and the aping and general. Do this! Look, I am being serious here. I never had a teacher. I don't really know. Oh, well, yeah. I never had a teacher, so like, you know, well, he, it's a mystery well, wrapped in a It's not, in a not note. like Ben was, Ben was more of an encouraging person than, I don't even know how you teach composition. To no. give you heart. He, he, no, he, no, he, he it was, his lessons are actually very funny, you know, you walk in, you hand him what you're working on, you look at it for five minutes, 
Yeah, keep working. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you'd sit there for 30 minutes. He was giving permission. No, I, I, I had no idea what he was doing, actually. We'd sit there for, in silence. For Did you figure that out after? after? I, I, I eventually figured out that Ben was... Were you rationalizing? No, Ben was teaching me like a Zen Buddhist. He wasn't going to tell me any answers that I didn't ask for. He was just going to sit there. We were going to be quiet until I asked him a question. Did it make you ask more questions? Eventually, but then the funny thing was I would ask a question that would get him going and he wouldn't stop for like a whole <laughs> hour. <laughs> But, uh, so it wasn't by the clock. Yeah, it was clock and sort of no chair. It was by the clock. He was by the clock. Would you say he was letting you find your own way in composition? Because a lot of composers work that way. Yeah, uh, yeah. He, I think he had the flexibility, the aesthetic breadth, to um, mm -hmm. kind of guide people along. But I'm not sure. Uh, mainly, what I feel like I got from Ben as a composer was just a perspective on. Constructing pieces, right. you know, his, his ability to analyze music was really good. So, thank you very much. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to hear all that. Uh, would you be so kind as to present sure. a little acapella? Yeah. yeah. No, no instruments play. allowed. Well, this is an instrument. You could use that if you like. You could I think you could use this an instrument. <laughs> you know, I could. You could. I don't know if Lawrence would like that. <laughs> I need to sing into the mic. Does it get rusty? Yeah. <laughs> You might like that. I mean, right. I guess we're going to do Mock Turtle again. So this is uh, called O and E at the Beach, Orpheus and Eurydice. And... Um, Are you a composer? I am. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is microtone. Oh, sure. this is different. Isn't this the one you're talking about? Okay, I'll check. Look, what are you talking about? This one or this one? Is it that That's one? The one? That's the one. Okay. <laughs> Ocean. 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 Master of Opera. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> so uh, what interests you in microtonality? I mean, you're a, a polymicrotonalist. And what, what does that generate for you? What does that construe? Because uh, I well, remember making that word up with John Cadler uh, in 1981 when we threw one new note, just one single new note, uh -huh. into a piece. And that was a note that was not in a tuning, and that opened up the door to polymicrotonal. Right. How do you feel? Well, my, my first uh, polymicrotonal piece was my opera, Downtown and Ropes the Air. Which one was that now? Downtown and Ropes. I know, which number? <laughs> I, I don't remember. Oh, that's okay. Downtown and Ropes. Downtown and Ropes. Uh, in 1978. And the characters are so different, and their part in the drama is so different that I decided I'd see what would happen if I contrasted just intonation with uh, where, you know, you can create a solid string of harmony and the further you move away from the center you choose, the more discordant it becomes until finally it happens. It's very Bach. Which is, yeah, yeah. It's very Bach. Right. I mean, the Bergmeister three tuning of Bach puts you in D minor for all his great works. And that's the most consonant, and then everything moves away from it, including the chromatic fantasy. Everything does that. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So you're, and, you're, you're and moving uh, away from pretty things. And then on the other hand, uh, Danton's music. Danton had the largest public library in France. I mean, largest private library in France, excuse me. And uh, he was someone who uh, was capable of, of understanding yes. other people and not just ideas, you know? And, and I thought it would make a nice contrast if I used, for him, just simply uh, uh, division, quarter tone, six tones, and so on. The, most of the orchestra is divided in quarter tones. The hearts so you really, you uh, six tones? in the years I know John, and people have said to me, I should know him way before I did. I want you to know that. <laughs> I'm certainly glad we did get to know each other. I'll Same here. Uh, <laughs> what I'm thinking is you, you're uh, comfortable with the opera, which means you're not doing string quartet, you're not doing symphony, oh, you're not yes, doing, I am. you're doing yeah. other things. Yeah, mostly. You stay pretty I don't, busy. I don't do much for orchestra. I don't know why, but I. Uh, when, when I have an orchestra, I'd like to have some singers involved. You know? We're going to do a piece of yours this uh, year. We've been trying to do pieces of his in the last few years. Uh, it's a piece for solo clarinet. Would you share something about this? Well, it, it's a piece that I um, uh, wrote for the clarinetist David Keverly, who I believe is performing it here. And he showed me a number of new techniques that he worked out in the clarinet. One thing that led me into microtonality in the first place was that I worked uh, in a group doing concerts of, uh, uh, of um, uh, contemporary music and jazz with a wonderful clarinetist who most of you probably know, William O. Smith. He was the first one to really develop monophonics. Anybody? And, William O. Uh, Smith? Great, well, I great not too many people know him. But anyway, I had <laughs> Bill to Smith, if, if, uh, oh, but, uh, but in any case, uh, uh, I found what attracted me to to, uh, to monophonics was the fact that they were their attitudinous. You know, the fact that, that one could move in different ways from one monophonic to another. And this piece is simply a further explanation. Can I, can I show everybody what we're talking about? Sure. sure. Ah! <laughs> That's a monophonic. Well, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> Acapella. I mean, <laughs> unless we get Toby here to sing like you know some rich color, and I mean, essentially what we're talking about is, at least longitudinally speaking, yeah, we're yeah. talking about two different uh, fundamentals sharing the tube simultaneously, and based on how they are connected to the lower numbers, then we get a sense of hollowness versus grit, and all the other numbers are going to bounce or at least not bounce, but uh, rub up against the, the what looks like chance uh, lineup, but it's not chance at all. So the player is able to actually maneuver those two relationships. They can, he, can, he or she can move them further apart or, for, or closer together, 
and therefore completely change the physicalness. It's like tempera paint. Right. Right? Exactly. We're talking about Van Gogh here. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Let's let's call it for what it is. Van <laughs> Gogh. Well, and, you know, furthermore, the monophonics are so different. There are some that are very, very beautiful, very, very subtle. There are some that make you reach, uh, you know, for your private parts immediately. <laughs> but, but there's a problem. <laughs> fear, you know. Fear. We, we mentioned fear. <laughs> we, we might start the war tonight. <laughs> but uh, David had, had, uh, was a student of Bill's. And he happened to be in Rome at the same time that I was there one year. And uh, uh, there was a, um, well, actually, there was someone who was teaching Latin who was the Pope's classicist, uh, Reginald Foster. Did, did anybody understand him? <laughs> well, you know, actually, he taught Latin by having people speak it. And they would go, one, one thing that was unusual was they'd go to a pizzeria in Rome. And they'd order in Latin. Sounds better with cheese in your teeth? Person to per yeah. <laughs> well, they'd sometimes end up with other things than what they ordered, I guess. But in any case. Found Latin. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, I, I wanted to write a, a piece for him because my wife had been studying uh, with him. And he was such an incredible human being. He, he uh, uh, took my son and I into uh, the Vatican to see. Raphael has always been a painter that I've uh, mm -hmm. absolutely loved. It. Did you find the design? Speaking of the art, this is an inspired. Oh. This piece that we're going to hear is inspired by artwork, <laughs> but the art's been apparently mis. It's a television. You, you it's know, I, I, I'm, I'm ashamed to say I looked, but you know, if you saw this is my, as abstract as it gets. It's based on the design of something we don't even know what it looks like. If, <laughs> if you saw my my uh, studio. You would understand and, why I'm and it, and it starts, anything. The response starts with the word if. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I'm going down for the third so, challenge. <laughs> so, no, no, I have to confess that I did not find the, the drawings that I started. Okay, so I will do but some ink blots. <laughs> I, I think the designs will, will, make them, will manifest themselves musically, or at least I hope so. Okay. You know? I thought it would be fun to uh, ask you on the spot to perform a piece of music with no preparation by a former colleague. Ladies and gentlemen, are you game? Absolutely. Well, I'll do my best. All right. <laughs> uh, you can stand for this if you like. You know, we can okay. get a drum roll. <laughs> okay. Maybe. Can I get Uh How about? Look, he's pretty brave. No rehearsal. John Cage is zero minutes and zero seconds. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentiles, reptiles, crocodiles, and Turkish towels, I stand before you, or I come before you to stand behind you. Before I speak or perform, I should like to say a few words. Uh, now, uh, this piece I have to ready myself for. It's a piece that John Cage wrote for Yoko Ono. And uh, I'm not being, as I say, my voice is midway between a frog and an aardvark and heap, so I don't, I, I don't know. But I have to be ready myself in order to be able to perform this. So you'll have to give me a minute. <laughs> Too many camera mister. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna sleep tonight. <laughs> oh. uh. Thank you very much. <laughs> Performance of zero minutes and zero seconds by John Cage. <laughs> <laughs> and now the band. Your performance was much okay. more elegant than <laughs> 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 so dare yours. We have Ella Quint right now. <laughs> <laughs> so Ella would like this. Ready?
Thank you. Rashid Ali, a uh, wonderful, great drummer. I had known about him for years. He played with Ron Kozak on one of the early festivals, on one of those peculiar ones where the sound didn't come out in the recording. I have a picture of him, though. And then uh, Vito here, he, he uh, had me join his uh, group. Uh, his lovely wife is back here, and she uh, was our lead singer. And uh, we had sometimes big bands, seven and nine. And then finally, it was. Me, you, me, you, and Lisa and Rashid. Lisa and, and Rashid. It was a quartet for like a couple times and until uh, he passed away. And, um, you know, it's nice to have uh, uh, April Centron, who uh, was a wonderful person to come in. And now we're kind of retired from it. But I thought, let's have an homage to, uh, to Rashid. Uh, I would think 
If anybody knows his moves, it's Vito Ricci. Well, you couldn't possibly do the moves that Rashid did. I mean, he actually, in some way, invented what what was what they began calling it later in his life the multi-directional way of drumming, rather than the no-directional way of drumming, which a lot of other early 60s jazz drummers were doing, like Milford Graves and Sonny Murray were doing sort of a no-direction. They were just sort of being avant-garde about it. But Rashid took it into a different spot and he made it feel like he was actually going somewhere, but he was going in a couple of different places at once. Of course, I wouldn't even begin to try to do what Rashid was doing. I played mostly with Rashid. We played hand drums. Wait, wait, wait. You're totally misrepresenting yourself. I thought you were going to play a Buddy Rich solo note for note. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be a, a true homage to Rashid in a way that I feel. If, if any of you have ever listened to the Interstellar, Interstellar Space record with just him and Coltrane playing, if you listen to just Rashid playing, you realize he's not playing very hard at all. Matter of fact, in a lot of that, I think he's even playing brushes. Because he's not doing what Elvin Jones was doing, he's competing with, with Coltrane. He was playing with Coltrane and advancing what he was doing. So with that in mind, and the other thing I would like to say is that Rashid's drums were always so impeccably in tune. I mean, he would spend quite a while just tuning the drums. And when you have drums that are that in tune, you don't really have to do much. These drums I didn't spend tuning on. <laughs> but my homage to Rashid. <laughs> Everything I believe inside, I just. Yeah. Hell with it. 
Yeah. Uh-huh. But uh, inten okay, intention. Uh, who, who's the funniest composers, composers, composers in history? Who's the funniest composer? Yeah, they have to be at least dead for a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know. But, I, I, but going back to the point. He doesn't words. know. Okay. Oh, I hear no, no, it's not. Like, I, don't like, it's not like, I don't care. I don't care. <coughs> he doesn't care. No, but but but, but uh, as far as intentionally funny, I mean, you know, well, you know, we can look at uh, you know all the this, you know, well, the Marx Brothers. Okay, I started with the Marx Brothers. Is that a hundred years? The Marx Brothers. A hundred years of of of, of, of what? I was trying to get to music. Yeah, well, I'm getting it. The Marx Brothers did music. Victor and Lucretia Borgia. Um, this one, what? He didn't talk much. Harper. 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 Yeah. Harper. Brilliant guy. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. 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 We all agree. That's what got me started. He said Victor, Victor, Lucretia. And now I overheard you. He's first of all the Queen of Hearts, by the way. And you know what I mean. I was Alice, and he was the Queen of Hearts. We did the Alice in Wonderland thing. Coming out soon to a. Theater near you. Uh, and uh, since then, we did some jam session uh, in Brooklyn, some old stone church, a house, or something like that. Yeah. And you said to me, What is it? The piano is my true instrument. And I wanted to explore that with you. Because this guy, he plays claviola with Simon and Garfunkel. He plays uh, Theremin and the Boxer. He, uh, he's, uh, he's playing. Uh, with the most advanced people I know in the world. So I'm just curious. What? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> me too. Well, well, I'm curious too. Well, 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 <laughs> what do you think? I so mean, you, you're a man of many. I want to know what you mean. No, I have a beaver in there. Well, what, what I want to know is this. <laughs> what I want to know here is, you say you identify with the piano. Now you're sitting next to a piano, so I don't know if you know that. <laughs> and I know, I know. Right here. <laughs> I, I'm just curious. What do you mean that you know the theremin is not number one? The piano is? No, the piano. The claviola is not number one. Piano is always and forever. Now, how does I it? Love it. How, how does it? How does it speak to you? Oh, everywhere. Uh -huh. it's do you like? Do you like hitting it and striking it? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes it hits and strikes. Do you like straight. jump on it? <laughs> And, it's, and, and, is it like, and we're still together. Is it a value that it's not a legend? No, I don't care. I, <laughs> I don't care about that. It's just. Uh, but I mean, I do have some. Uh, there are some hot competitors. Well, I know that you uh, went out of your way to get yourself a Harkin continuum. Harkin. Harkin. H A. He's Harkin. Harkin. He's Harkin. Harkin is the name of it. Harkin Stockin. It's yeah. Norwegian. Uh, no, but it would. It would? Uh, uh, perhaps not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 I thought it was a thing. But for the continuum. Circling the drain. <laughs> <laughs> you stepped out of a drain. <laughs> Love. What? Love. <laughs> so tell Love. me. How do you. How, what, what did the piano do to you? Because I know people that said, like Mayor Bloomberg said, uh, what is your greatest regret in your education? And he said that his mother forced him to play piano. What turned it around for you? <laughs> well, it was my first year as mayor, and no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, 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 it was just, it, it, the real story, no, tell me a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, a belief I must have a lie in it. Every belief Everything you believe ah, has a lie in it. L-R-E. <laughs> <laughs> Please continue. Who was I? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to find out. Okay. So what happened? What did the I piano do to well, you? Well, it pissed off my brother. My brother was taking lessons, and he was seven and I was three, and I just could see how pissed off he was when I would go in and play. So that was a good start. <laughs> and that was real, you know, motivation to get good. It's so a brotherly love. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then about two years later, I had gotten, I'd gotten to a point where I was feeling pretty good about myself. And then I had a party. 
and I could play the Snake Charmers dance. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, they're deaf, all right? I hear you. So, uh, so, so uh, and I discovered at this party, at my birthday party, when I played that, that all the girls would get under the couch like snakes, and when I would start playing, they would come out and dance around me. And I said, I, I'm getting the, uh, call me crazy, but I'm getting um, a good feeling about this. <laughs> I, see, I see my path. I see my path before me. And I've never strayed from that path. A path seer. <laughs> yeah. And the path was that you had to be at this level with your hands. No, I just wanted dancing girls around me. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. And uh, so then after that, the piano just didn't do it for you because you switched other instruments. No, <laughs> it's not that. I, I, I listen. Here, okay, so I started with uh, my. I mean, I played the electric guitar in high school and all that stuff. You know, blues rock stuff. You know, with all the bands, but. But uh, um, later, I, the therapy, I decided when I was in high school that I was going to practice. I played a lot. I decided I was going to give myself two weeks and practice really hard. And if I wasn't as good as John McLaughlin or Jimi Hendrix, I was going to quit. So I quit. And um, <laughs> I figured I'd just, you know, save myself the, the torture. But then when the therapy Saving came torture. Out, well, the thing about being a keyboard player, you know, in the rock bands in the 60s, is we had no, we couldn't bend notes, back to our microtonal th uh, thematic material. We weren't allowed. We no, weren't allowed. I mean, I, what am I, I'm going to go whammy bar on the piano. It's going to be, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a wrench. <laughs> That's a big fucking wrench. He got a wrench. <laughs> it's, it's a wrenchy story. Go ahead. Hit <laughs> me with a wrench. Microtonal. Okay. So, he took that wrench. <laughs> <laughs> it's wretched, it's wretched, the seizure salad. Um, so, so um, we couldn't bend notes and we didn't have vibrato. Um, I'm like, you know, it, it was like terrible. Could you shake the whole piano like this? I, I, yeah, it was just me shaking, you know, that was my own personal, personal vibrato. So, but then theremin, it was like, oh, I had sustain, I could hold a note forever. I could have vibrato, I could bend wherever mm -hmm. I wanted. But I like got, bending. <laughs> well, in it's that okay. case, that was pretty good. All right. But I got to say, I had my first conversation after I just got a theremin, and I was it was the most god awful thing you ever heard. <laughs> Nothing is worse. Well, maybe there's something is worse. So I, I got this, and my first, you know, <laughs> I just get the theremin, and I'm trying for the life of me to play something that anybody can recognize within a thousand miles, and it's impossible. So I'm going on. <laughs> And I go down to the bar, and one of my free jazz friends is down there. He goes, oh, you got a theremin. Now you can play microtonal music. I said, that is exactly <laughs> what I am trying to not to play. <laughs> let, me, let me get back to that in like, you know, 20 years. <laughs> Meanwhile, let me just play Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> you, know? so, you have to prove yourself all the time, right? Mary Had a Little Lamb was the, the testing range. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> uh, Josh, how did, would you have a question here for a, a person who says such a thing that he's like, he's like uh, tied uh, to the piano with chains? <laughs> you know, we're all tied to the instrument of our, you know, love with the chain because we want to be really great at it. You love it with the chains. <laughs> And if you're not, you're forced to be tied. You're not talking about chains of turns, are you? Chainsaw. But, but, but. It's past tense. A chain scene. I'm into a chain scene, you know? Uh, so. But I never said everybody wants to be better. That's the perfect subjunctive. So. Did you ever try to, like, play a piece and just say, okay, I'm going to play the, the, the black notes instead of the white ones? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You give a switch to right left hand? Yeah. And just proceed? Sure. Okay. Ah. <laughs> curious. Um, but, but there's this... Uh, I know you like the top up. What? I know you like the top up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> he <laughs> likes the top bottom. That's right. He does this to everybody. No. Josh, you know what I mean. Do you need the top up all the time? Not all the time. <laughs> all, the time. <laughs> all the time. Just so we like point it out. Man yeah, likes the top yeah, up. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's just my thing. You know, I, I you know, I, you know, people can. No, never. So, <laughs> so I, um, I basically thank you for coming here. Can uh, I say one more thing please before do. I, uh, you can even make a commercial if you like. Okay, uh, my commercial's for the Hacken Continuum. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> 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 so anyway, just quick, just for, uh, I got this instrument called the Hacken Continuum, which is a fully microtonal, fully polyphonic touch instrument, and it's about as long as a Bosendorfer Imperial keyboard, and you play it. I mean, you have the potential of sounding as bad as ten theremins at once, <laughs> <laughs> but but the the the, the uh, there's a lot of potential there for. You know, things microtonal and not microtonal. But uh, all stuff. Okay, that's my commercial. I've seen him do it and I can vouch for it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I've seen him play it and I can vouch for it. A witness! We have a witness! <laughs> Pay me or I'll do it again. I swear, I'll do it again. Go! <laughs> the only thing I didn't get. Stand up. Can you handle it? <laughs> Just make sure you're tuning your based on 60 hertz. It's 60 hertz. <laughs> it hurts. It hurts. <laughs> so, uh. Oh, I was uh, late. <laughs> <laughs> you're late. You're late. Thank you were late.
have a great time.